chair this evening. Um, we expand, uh, so yeah, last month we expanded the chapter to include parts of South Burlington and Winooski that are neighboring towns uh, to Burlington, which is really exciting. And I um, live in South Burlington and, but had been going to the Burlington meeting since about 2015, I guess, um, when Isaac and Elise were kind of um, had the reins. And then, um, you know, just I had talked to Rad about expanding it to offer um, more opportunity for neighboring towns. We had a lot of folks coming from Winooski and myself in South Burlington, and I wanted to bring in some more South Burlington folks to join and get involved. So I'm excited that that has come to fruition and excited to welcome people. And if this is your first meeting, thank you so much for coming uh, and joining us. And uh, just a couple housekeeping notes. There is live transcript available at the bottom and this meeting is being recorded and um, perhaps will be on YouTube. I know some of them are later on. And um, yeah, we just have a really exciting agenda tonight. Um, we're going to hear from our former Lieutenant Governor, David Zuckerman, who's eating ice cream. And um, I, some of you may have heard in the beginning, um, Taylor, Rep. Taylor Small um, is supposed to speak, but unfortunately there is a lot going on at the State House right now with a bunch of bills on the floor. So she may have to go last or late um, or come back next month. So these chapter meetings will be held um, every month and we're excited to keep building them up. And I keep creating the challenge for friends and, and fellow uh, organizers to bring a friend anytime and just introduce them, challenge them to come to one meeting, see how they feel and if it's a good fit. And if not, that's okay too. So thank you to everyone who committed to come and showed up, it really means a lot. Um, to me and also to rights and democracy. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in Vermont. I've lived here for 35 years. I grew up in Charlotte and now living in South Burlington since 2007. And um, I've done a lot of organizing work for mostly electoral campaigns in Burlington, city council races, um, county races, and um, a few statewide races. Uh, I recently um, became chair, which is very exciting. And thank you so much for everyone welcoming me and Tom and Sophie from RAD. Um, also recently was an organizer on Just Cause Eviction um, with a lot of folks on the call and very successful campaign, very excited about that and hearing about some of the next steps from Tom. And um, also one other thing, uh, recently last week, um, I just started doing some work with a newer org uh, called Vermont Welcome Wagon. And for those of you who haven't heard of that organization, it's pretty cool, it's newer. It's a statewide effort to, um, we'll just let that person in. Uh, it's a statewide effort to help um, people who are from Vermont or returning to Vermont um, get to know their community. So we have county chapters across the state and they asked me to um, organize the Chittenden chapter. So I've been working on that and it's been really great meeting a lot of new Vermonters and kind of connecting them to things in their, oh, there's Laura, to their community and uh, excited that eventually we'll have some in-person events. And um, if anyone is interested in that, uh, basically you can also be a host for a new or returning, Ver, you know, returning Vermonter and help them kind of integrate back. Uh, it's Vermont Welcome Wagon. I can drop it in the chat in a minute. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I can, I can link it in there. Yeah, it's a great new organization and I'm really excited to be working for them and um, just helping people learn about their community and, and help other community members. And right now the hosts are meeting with folks on Zoom and then, like I said, eventually um, we will have 
hopefully some in-person meetups. And then we, I am writing, we send out a bi-monthly newsletter uh, about happenings in each county. So it's really exciting. So um, I will definitely drop that info. So without further ado, um, I don't really need any introduction notes for this person. Um, I met David Zuckerman in, I guess, I think 1998, perhaps. 97, 98, I think. Yeah. So it's quite quite a bit. Of time. I remember the day. A lifetime ago. And uh, I was a, a young lady and um, there was this really exciting um, young legislator that I saw um, doing some inspiring work. And um, he was a legislator with my father at the time. And um, David was just a different type of legislator than anyone else in the building and you just knew it and I knew that even as a kid and um, David was kind enough to um, be I would consider him my mentor and I've spent the last seven years working for him until recently and it was an honor as always to be on all of his campaigns and I've invited David here today to talk about um, some of the organizing that that, oops, sorry, that he's done over the past couple decades. Um, as, a as a fellow organizer, I can think of few people um, who have led the charge on issues before their time from marriage equality, GMO labeling, cannabis reform, um, raising the wage, a, a slew of critical issues that are really important to me and to people I care about. So. Um, David was a state rep in Burlington, um, in the district that Brian and Selena are in now. And then he was our Senator in Chittenden County, um, living in Hinesburg. And then our incredible Lieutenant Governor, 81st Lieutenant Governor, I believe. And, um, I'm thrilled to welcome David and have him talk about some of his organizing and how all of us can take our ideas into action at the state house and on a statewide level and connect with our legislators and leaders and um, move things forward that we care about. So without further ado, David, take it away. Well, thank you, Emily. Um, I don't know that I have a lot to offer after all that. <laughs> um, no, it's it's been an amazing amazing ride and and um, so many so many key different issues and yet unfortunately so many more still to tackle as everyone on this call knows I mean we still have you know worse income inequality than we did when I started um, we still have huge social justice issues to continue to tackle and address and and hate to um, counter with with love and organizing and. Um, and I'm really excited that all these folks are here. There's a bunch of people I don't know, which is really the most fun for me, um, having been involved in politics in Vermont and organizing for 20, 25 years. Sometimes I get on calls, I'm like, where's the new people or where's people I don't know? And I'm really thrilled that there's a bunch of people on this um, Zoom chat as I look around the screen that I don't know. So super amazing um, to see that energy. So thank you for being here. Um, I guess, uh, I could go on for a while, but I'm going to focus on on a couple key things. Um, one is that for those that are either newer to Vermont or newer to activism in Vermont, an individual voice or a few voices can really have a, a pretty amazing and profound impact on the movement of the discussion and the movement of policy uh, in ways that in other states I just don't think is is as true um, because it's so small here, and I. I often will say to people, especially those that I don't know yet, um, the legislators that you're trying to influence, um, I try to remind everyone that they're people too. Uh, and that in fact, they know what they know. And there's a lot of things that they don't know in the same way that each of us knows what we're passionate about, but often have a lot to learn from others. And as legislators, you do learn little bits and pieces of a really wide range of topics. 
but you only go deep on either what you know or what your committee's work is. And so in dealing with legislators and, and sort of shifting the conversation in the political arena, which is, I think, some of what I'm supposed to focus on, um, I would say the first thing to do when you call your legislator is sort of ask them where they are on something before you tell them where you are. Because one of the things that you can start to figure out is that A, they may not know very much about it. B, they may already be where you want them to be. C, they might be malleable because they don't yet know yet and they've got a constituent calling and they're like, well, I wanna make sure I keep my constituent kind of happy. Um, because again, in a small district, one person telling 25 other people that, I called my rep and they were really dismissive or they didn't listen or they weren't responsive can really be damaging to someone's uh, future, you know, re-election or run for some other office. And so they, they want to be respectful to you um, most of the time. And they're pretty decent people, even if they do disagree. So the first thing I encourage is ask them where they are on something. Do you know about this issue? Have you heard about this bill? Um, and if you say a bill number, they're going to ask you for more because honestly, there's over a thousand bills. So sometimes if you're following a bill, you might know the bill number. They won't know what the bill number is unless it's in their committee. Um, and just try to have a everyday conversation with them about it. Say, you know, I've been following this topic, you know, and then you go into police reform, uh, spending money on health care, uh, you know, whatever the issue might be. And um, you often as a passionate person about a topic, whether it's your workplace situation, whether it's the, the field of work that you do that you know a lot about, whether it's what's driving you to be involved in this, this Zoom call or whatever, whatever's, whatever your passion is, you probably know more about it than they do. And what I've often encouraged when I used to travel the state trying to help build excitement about an issue that I might have been talking about. And, and the example I always use is uh, GMOs, which was back in the early 2000s. I would go to communities, meet with five people in a living room or 15 people in a coffee shop or 12 people in a church basement. And I would remind them that GMOs at that point, most legislators had never heard of. They weren't involved in agriculture. They didn't know about the issues of the increased herbicides and pesticides and what it all meant to the food systems. And so I'd say to them, you know, if you call your rep and ask them about the GMO bill, you're going to give me as a legislator who is aligned with you on the issue more clout in the building because I would introduce the bill and most legislators were like, okay, whatever that is. And they'd, they'd not really look at it. But suddenly if constituents called their legislator and their legislator would then say to them, well, I need to look up more about the bill. I need to ask the ag committee people if it's moving or not. Let me get back to you. They would then come to me. Of course, I had been in their district. They didn't know that. But they would then come to me and say, you know, Representative Zuckerman, uh, what, what is this GMO bill? Can you tell me more about it? Because I've got some, you know, a couple constituents who are calling. So suddenly you've helped whoever your legislative champion is on the issue you care about, become more relevant to that other legislator because they wanna be able to answer to their constituents in a, in a knowledgeable way what the topic is. And so it's really amazing how three or four phone calls from a, from a district to a legislator will propel an issue and start bubbling it up towards the top. Because as I said earlier, there's often a thousand or eleven hundred bills introduced, and you know a hundred or so pass each year, and how they become the issues that get taken up is all about what gets starting to be talked about. So, as an organizer, what I would say is calling or working with friends in two or three or five districts, or sometimes statewide, getting a few more people talking about issues. Suddenly, the chair of the committee starts getting questions from four or five legislators around the state, going hey, what's going to happen with H217, the GMO labeling bill? And they're going to be like, oh, well, uh, we had some other things on the agenda. It was like, well, I've got a constituent. So that's how you build momentum on the bills is, is conversation, questions, and, um, and sometimes it's a few conversations. 
because that's the other thing. You know, I'm a, a big fan of rallies and marches and, you know, let's get a lot of people out in the streets or on city hall steps or at the state house steps. And I think that builds momentum for things. And that's one energy and one way, you know, when you're talking through the bullhorn, it's like, rah! And then it's a different energy when you're calling your legislator, your representative or your senator, because that's more of a conversation over a cup of coffee or through a screen. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, Emily, as sort of a recap on like how I think you can be really effective as citizens trying to mm. make change. Um, that's that's very helpful. Thank you. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, let's take a couple questions um, now. Um, and then I have a, a couple more things to ask David as well. So um, Suzanne, why don't you um, ask your question? All right. Hello. Hello, Dave. Um, so my question is, so if you're working on a bill, hi, I haven't seen you forever. <laughs> um, if you're working on a bill, and okay, perfect example. Two years ago, wanton waste bill was up for in the Natural Resources Committee. Sat around probably on the fourth meeting that I went to for that specific wanton waste bill. Rep Jim McCullough said, We have received more, um, what's the word? Not opposition, um, for whatever the opposition. We have received more calls, more letters, more. Everybody's saying we want this bill from all walks of life, hunters, blah, 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 blah. More so than every single bill, every single comment I've received for or against Prop 5 combined. All the other reps at the Senate, the committee sat around and agreed with him. Rep Sheldon went forth and just passed it on to Fish and Wildlife for, I have my own personal issues about that that I want to get to. My question is, when you have a rep or a senator who is, and you've been so, how do you get past that? You know, how do you get past them being like, okay, I'm just gonna pass it on, even though everybody wants it, or you've worked so hard, like Green New Deal, oh my gosh, why the hey did that not pass? You know, how do you get past that not passing? Yeah, there's probably like, a couple of <laughs> I, I missed the name of the bill you said at the very beginning, just so I could know the topic better. Um, wanton waste bill. That wanton is, waste. What's that? Yeah, I, I could actually look it up. I forgot That's the okay. bill. That is for um, basically the killing for the sake of killing, like the wildlife, coy the coyote contest, the crow contest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Um, so a few things. I'm surprised the bill was actually in Representative Sheldon's committee because that would seem more like a fish and wildlife bill um, than a natural resources bill, which is it's probably- It's natural resources fish and wildlife. They always go to her. Oh, are they blended now? That's yep. right. A few years ago like, in the house that got blended. When I was in the house, they were separate committees. My apologies. Yeah. Um, I don't know where, where she sent it then. That is odd. Um, a few things. The, I guess when there, what I would do is look at who else is on the committee. You know, did, along with Rep McCullough, were other legislators also hearing as much as he was? Um, Every single person. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'll shut up. I'm shut up. In the Green New Deal, which is, I guess, not particularly that bill because that. No, but in general, what what do you do? So I think there's a few things. One is, you know, my my opening was all about the cordial relationship, the reaching out and talking to them, and getting the back and forth, and having those two or three or five conversations. But at some point, if a lot of people are feeling like there's some sort of road blocking going on and you don't know why, um, yes. then you start to get more public about it. You know, I think many people underutilize letters to the editor and underutilize in particular uh, now digger um, commentaries. And I think people have a lot more legs to stand on and your words are taken much more seriously by a lot of other readers as well as political people. If you say, you know, I've talked with my legislator who said they've gotten a lot of positive support for this bill, whatever the bill is, whatever the topic is. And it seems like in talking to others that other legislators are getting that. For some reason, it's not moving. And um, it would be great if other people could call their legislators and ask why not. Because what happens is oftentimes 
people in the building think that most folks outside the building aren't paying attention. So they might get 100 phone calls and emails. And that's a lot, by the way. That's a tremendous number um, on some topic. And, you know, from across the state, you know, it might be six from their district and 100 total from around the state. And the people organizing think that's a lot. That's 100. And it is a lot. But if they think that it's a really active but small group of people, then they still might not feel like it's the broader public sentiment. And it's a really hard thing to gauge as a legislator, what is the broad general sentiment. And, and sometimes you get inundated with a, a slew of emails in two days and you go, okay, someone said send emails in these two days and you get a slew of them, but then you don't get any other contact. You know, you're at the grocery store, nobody brings it up. You're at the dump, nobody brings it up. You're at other places and it, it you're trying to weigh, is this something that a few people are really adamant and well-organized around, or is this a broader sentiment? And um, particularly, I would say for rural Democrats, uh, a bill that takes on the hunting and trapping industry is tricky for them because they also would believe, I'm being very specific to the bill you were just talking mm -hmm. about in terms of these, um, because there is a there's a big community in the rural areas that that you know still does these things. On the other hand, I remember that at least the the coyote hunt one. I remember that being in the news. I remember there being other talks about it that it just seemed completely absurd. Um, and so I I don't know why they didn't take it up, um, but I would say going more and more public. So you start with the person to person, then you go to you know a little higher level, and then you go public with it. If you if you embarrass politicians like right out the bat, you go straight to the media with letters to the editor and everything saying this person's a jerk when you haven't even talked to them yet, then they're going to be like, that person is off their rocker. But if you've been respectful to them and they've been honest with you about, yes, we're passing it or no, we're not. And here's why. And here's why I stand where I stand. Then I think you have more legs to stand on and, and sort of doing a public I wouldn't say shaming, but a public exposure. Yeah, of what's no, that's on. great. But also, like, I won't, I won't get into my issues with Rep. Sheldon. But, um, but say the Green Green New Deal. Like, why did that not go? Like, so when something is so highly publicized, but it still is shot down. Healthcare. So one, you know how much yeah. my family's been involved in the healthcare. So, like, right. How do you I, get past that? So I, I know Noah also had a question, but I'll be quick with this, sorry, which is sorry. that. Any, I think the Green New Deal bill, which I also, you know, talked a lot about in my campaign, everything else, also had to do with raising money. And anytime you're going to raise money, you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks. And this is where um, sometimes I think there might be a uh, some some tension between Democrats and progressives, for instance, where um, progressives are often more willing to talk about a more progressive taxation system to generate the resources to do the things we need to do. You know, whether it's generating resources for mental health support in the community or housing or, and, or you know, climate investment. Um, others, the, the coaching for people who are running for office is often don't talk about taxes, don't go there because it's just a really hard thing to do. Well, be, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you never talk about it, then it stays hard to do, um, particularly if you don't describe the differences between progressive taxation and you know taxation that's gonna really hit a lot of working class people hard. And so um, that's to me that the reason that the, the issue of the Green New Deal typically wouldn't move is, you know, Anthony talked about a $30 million bill. I talked about a hundred million dollar bill. Um, those are big numbers and people out there are struggling and they quickly get um, the word tax is a hard word and the Republicans are really good at using it as a boogeyman when we don't describe it well and talk about who we're talking about and what it's for. And so often that's why I would think the Green New Deal didn't move. Um, I'd love to keep going back and forth, but I, I think Noah had to- Yeah. Yeah, um, catch up anyways. Okay, <laughs> thank and, you. And one other thing I'll add too um, that is that most reps have, um, I know I go to mine, um, my four South Burlington reps do a legislative update. It's on Zoom now. It used to be on the, yeah, at, the at the library. Um, but I've 
gone. Um, just this last Monday, I was pressing them about um, vaccinating uh, people in incarceration and they were all like, eh, meh. but um, they were a little squirrely about it. But, you know, we, you know, you go and um, press them in those environments and it definitely helps. So I think most, I know um, Deanna, or sorry, Taylor now has small talk with Taylor and in Burlington, I believe some of the Burlington reps have uh, coffee hours and whatnot. So those are always good resources uh, to uh, check out as well. So um, let's go to Noah. Had a question? Yeah. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Good. <laughs> um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the pension situation going on. Um, it's something that's been pretty concerning to me, um, to a lot of the other teachers in the state, and then obviously statewide employees as well. Uh, for over the course, I mean, the, the situation kind of has unfolded pretty quickly. Um, the actual plan dropped today. There's going to be testimony on Friday. Um, and so I've encouraged people to sign up for that. Um, there's been a lot of noise kind of on online circles and stuff, but I, my understanding of it is that they're going to try to fast track it and get something passed. Um, so other than reaching out to my reps directly, other than signing up to make, to testify that sort of thing, um, if it really is going to be fast tracked, what are the next steps that we should take after kind of going through the traditional channels of contacting a rep? and then planning to speak? Well, you know, I, I, I think this is where a group like Rights and Democracy is great because you're nonpartisan, right? And you can express to any political party that's, that's either in power or wants to be in power um, that you're frustrated if they're gonna be going against workers and the commitments that government made and has made over decades um, to, you know, uh, make people whole through their pensions. You know, there are people that have done work for 20 and 30 years expecting something to be one way. And if it's going to get changed, or certainly if it's going to get changed for the, sometimes they do it where it's generational. They're going to be like, well, you still get the old system and you're going to be under a new system. Um, first of all, I think standing in solidarity is really important. And it's really important. See you, Keenan. Sorry, you didn't win. Um, and, um, uh, I, I just think that we have to hold, including, you know, when I was in office, you got to hold our feet to the fire. You know, a lot of people run for office and they're coached to be really vague in their statements. I mean, I've seen this in people that run statewide, you know, they'll say, Vermont's a great place. We're going to do great things and things are going to be better. And we feel really good about it. We're like, yeah. And they have a good, a better label after their name. So they must be good when in reality, they haven't really said anything, right? And I think people on this call know that, right? You've got to really draw out from candidates, really, what are you going to do about minimum wage? What do you believe in with respect to progressive taxation so that we don't cut pensions? You know, what do you, you know, what, what's happened over the last 30 or 40 years, and we're seeing this in infrastructure, we're seeing it in mental health supports, we're seeing it in affordable housing, is in order to not raise taxes, there's these quiet little ways that we spend less and less money on things. And then eventually they build up to a point where they bite us in the, you know what? And unfortunately, after 40 years of Reaganomics and then 25 years of Clintonomics, it's, it's been this, you know, quote, trickle down economy that has failed. And we're now picking up the pieces from the climate to pensions, to housing, to mental health, to education. And it's a really crappy situation right now. Uh, and so saying to people in power that, you know, it's, it's not acceptable to have people giving in over and over and over again on things like this. We need to raise the revenues, not cut the programs and cut the supports and cut the pension funding. And this happened four years ago with Bill Scott. We had, I think it was 30 extra million dollars at the end of the year and he wanted to do property tax cut for one year with it. And the rest of us were saying, no, put it towards pension and 30 million invested then is gonna be a hundred million in return later to help with this huge deficit in the pension fund. And we lost that fight because again, people said, no, I want $20 off my taxes for one year, um, which 
It's certainly important, but what we need to do is say, well, let's raise your wages. Let's get you health care. Let's do these things. They're going to save you a whole lot more money than $20. But you got to pressure the parties and, and the party leadership and call leadership. You know, you can call your own rep. And then that's where the speaker and the pro tem and the party leaders are also folks to call. If I called the speaker and I did not get a response, should I just keep calling? Um. You know, the second call, you might say, um, you know, I've tried to leave you a respectful message. I'd really like to get a call back. Or if I need to get a group of people together, would that help? You know, like if you can talk to five of us at once, because the speaker's pretty busy. So it's helpful if you can coordinate with a few people. Yeah. And then again, if someone doesn't respond after a second or third attempt, especially if you say I can get eight or 10 people together, so it's an efficient use of your time, then you start to publicly call them out. And I got to tell you, the last thing anybody wants is to be publicly called out as an elected official. And it's embarrassing. And it's also really hard because Vermont's a small state. Noah, obviously, you were very involved with the party for a while. You were on the executive committee. If you call out a Jill Kowinski or a Becca Ballant or a whomever, um, you're going to get a personal phone call from someone that's going to say, I can't believe you did that. How dare you? Blah, blah, blah. And I think for all of us, you have to say the issues are more important than than these sort of political personal friendships. These are affecting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I tried, I tried to do it in a respectful way first, you know? Yeah, no, um, we'll, we'll do one more question be before we go on to our next speaker, but yeah. And, and thank you, Noah, um, for your advocacy um, and as a, an educator. And um, I, I recently wrote an op-ed in Digger um, about pensions um, as the daughter of of two educators. Um, it's something that I've been watching very carefully and I'm as frustrated as the next, but um, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. Uh, it's, it's really hard. And um, I also emailed and spoke to my senators and didn't get responses from everyone. And um, I know how frustrating that can be um, for sure. So it's, it's hard. And um, so we'll take one last question for David, then we're gonna go to our next speaker, but um, I'm sure folks have a million questions for David. And um, as many of you who know him, know, oh, thank you, <laughs> know how accessible he is. So he's always willing to chat and um, that we're all very grateful and uh, for that. Oh yeah, there's his personal email for everyone. So that's great. So, okay, um, Jean, you had a question for David before we move on. Uh, I do. Hi, David. How are you? Hi. Good um, to see you. Likewise. Um, so, Burlington passed uh, just cause eviction 64%. It's an only Burlington bill. The landlord um, lobby is incredibly strong in the state of Vermont uh, for anybody who's followed housing um, and tenants' rights. So, I'm curious about your thoughts on how we can pass um, uh, the charter changes and get them to the governor and him to sign it. Um, and the opportunities that exist given that we have people in South Burlington and Winooski here as well and in Hinesburg. Um, so that, uh, yeah, your, your thoughts on, on that. Well, a few things. Um... A lot of times, <clears throat> uh, charter changes are one of the few things that sometimes happen after crossover and still get pushed along because obviously town meeting day is pretty late in this process from the legislative calendar. Um, but given that it passed overwhelmingly, first of all, you know, it's got to get introduced. And I would hope all 10 or 10 and a half or 11 Burlington reps would co-sponsor that. Uh, and of course, you've got the Speaker of the House in the Old North End and Jill Krowinski. So I think that, you know, checking in with her early on and soon and saying, you know, are you going to help make sure this gets taken up in government operations um, would be what I would do, uh, certainly as constituents of hers in the Old North End. That's where I would start. Um, I, as far as, you know, the typical thing that the legislator legislature looks at is so long as it um, fits within the constitution and isn't um, going to be illegal in some other way, most charter changes, you know, are going to move through, especially when they've got a really solid vote like that. You know, sometimes if it's 
51 49 and it's particularly controversial it's going to be harder to do um but i think just being persistent and positive it should that that one i would think would move through even with the power of the of the uh landlords the other um trying to think who's on GovOps in the Senate and in the House, but I would look to see whether any Burlington reps or senators are on those two committees and just ask them to be a, a, a regular little nudge to their chairs, um, because that's another way to uh, make it happen. Yeah, Keisha is on, well, she's not in Burlington anymore, but she is- but She Burlington. represents the, the yeah, senators from yep, Tennant County. Right, yeah. and an ally. Um, also, so for, for the House, uh, for GovOps uh, would be Bob Hooper is on um, GovOps yeah. for Burlington. And, and my last quick thing, um, Emily, because I know you want to move on, is just remember, particularly with the senators from Chittenden County, they represent about 140,000 people. So if you don't always hear back from them, a little bit of grace before you string them up in public with a letter to the editor would be you know, kind of reasonable to expect. They have zero staff. As a legislator in the House, you've got four to 8,000 constituents, maybe nine or 10, depending you know, if it's a two-seat district. So they ought to be able to get back to you by email. But I also know this year in particular, with them Zooming for eight hours a day, then in the evening, they're supposed to do email constituent replies. It's, it's got to be draining. Um, and so try to give them a little bit of, uh, of patience. Um, if, if you can manage it in the moment that we're all in with so much anxiety about you know, the future and so many issues. But again, they are humans, um, sometimes with families, sometimes with other issues going on, physical health, mental health, whatever. But uh, just being pleasant and persistent for a while before you slam them publicly is probably a good thing. <laughs> Thanks. That's always nice. Yeah. Um, Thanks for the opportunity. And I'm so psyched you're all here. That's great. Yeah, thanks so much, David. And, um, you know, we love having you and, and hopefully you'll return again um, someday to public office. I know that I can only speak for myself, but probably most other people on this call, um, we're really wishing for a Zuckerman administration and look forward to your next steps, um, of course. So thank you so wow. much as always for being thank here and, and we're very supportive. Um, thank you. All right. Well, um, our next amazing speaker um, is Laura Hale. And uh, Laura has 21 years in Vermont um, experience working with nonprofits, city government, grassroots, gr grassroots groups on program development, accountability to the community, system creations, and fundraising. Laura is currently the grant writer for the Janet S. Munt Family Room and does constituent outreach for Burlington City Councilors, Brian Pine and Max Tracy, and the president of the One or ONE uh, Good Deed Fund. Um, I first met Laura in 2015 um, when they were um, managing Sarah Giannoni, now Sarah Moore's camp. City Council, successful city council campaign. Um, that was one of the first city council campaigns in Burlington that I was um, volunteering on and it was very exciting. And um, Laura is just a wonderful person and does so much for the Burlington community. And um, I really wanted to invite them to share some of the things that they're working on, what they have been working on and how we as a community in the greater Burlington area can get involved and hopefully help them um, with some of their efforts. So Laura, uh, take it away and thank you so much um, for fitting us in your, your schedule of all the important things that you're working on. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is so funny. I literally just had back-to-back -back meetings all day. So like <laughs> Dave saying like you're up on Zoom all day, it drains you. That is so true. That is a hundred percent true. Um, I think we all probably could use a little grace these days. Um, gosh, you know, I wish I had really inspiring stuff I was working on right now, but I've spent the last two months doing like small o, o organizing because there's a person who's been in Burlington for a really long time who is, we all just kind of thought was like 
a bit of a sexual harasser, but it turns out it's actually a true predator and sexual assaulter. And it's been two months of listening to women, all, all women um, in the community talking to me and sharing their stories and doing research and digging into what's really been truly horrific behavior that's been swept under the rug by a lot of people. Um, yeah, so normally I'm good at giving a really like inspiring speech about being part of your community, but all I can, I just wanna start off by saying that there's one thing I've really come to appreciate in the last two months that I think is something that's really, really important for those of us that work with issues is to really respect people's stories. Um, I think it gets so tempting, right? When you're so passionate about something to take a quote or take a story and, and just share it and use it and publicize it, right? But you have to remember that you're talking about someone's lived experience and they granted it to you, right? You're borrowing from them. You don't own it, they do. And usually the only power that any of us have is to talk about what we've experienced, right? And it's just, I made sure with the women I talked to that every single time I shared their story, I got their approval and told them exactly who I was sharing it with. And I showed them exactly how it was being written down and how I had transcribed it from the conversation. And they got approval every step of the way. And anyone I gave their stories to had to promise me and tell me explicitly how they were going to use them. And if they break that trust, it's a small town, I'm gonna know right? Like your word and how you treat other people is so important. Um, you know, this is a really small state in a small community. And if you're not working with integrity with the people you work with, go someplace else, right? Like there are so many people you'll end up working with that are really there for building up their own name and their own career. And they'll throw you under the bus in a hot second. And you know what? Those people don't last. Everyone knows Everyone knows who they are. No one wants to work with them. Don't be that person, right? Be the person that someone says, oh, I had a really experience, good experience working with them, right? Like I would totally work with them again. Um, sorry, so it's been, it's, been, it's been difficult. It's been really hard and this stuff happens all the time. And I think it's, this is maybe what I can pass along about folks who are gonna end up working on issues that really affect you very personally. Um, it's gonna burn you out. It's gonna be really hard. Um, tell other people, work with other people, tell your friends how you're feeling, have people check in on you, check in on them, right? Like I can't speak to getting bills passed that I haven't done that in a while. I don't really want to, honestly, like I spent so many years getting legislation passed and lobbying for efforts. And I was the executive director of a statewide coalition of free clinics. And I spent a lot of time telling legislators about how healthcare policies in the state were literally killing people. And I sat and gave testimony and I watched people stare blankly at me as I was explaining to them how people were literally dying because they couldn't get to doctors. And at some point it just broke me, right? Like you have that point where you've been trying to explain to people that you're working with and trying to like just convince um, that it can just burn you out and kind of kick you in the butt. And so talk to other people about how you're doing, ask your friends how they're doing, right? And please don't ask them about self-care because so many of my friends and I laugh when someone's just like, what kind of self-care are you engaging in? Because you're like, no, just ask them how they're doing, right? Like, <laughs> and, and I am gonna go back to the kind of work I do. That's not this, but I just, you know, that's been like, I literally just got out of five meetings back to back doing this. Um, but yeah, so, <laughs> Time out. My other work around town. So I do run um, the One Good Deed Fund, which is literally just a small nonprofit I built to fund neighborhood projects. You know, I worked for the city of Burlington for a long time. Well, not a long time, but I was the director of the AmeriCorps Vista program there um, and then did community outreach and um, watched slowly the funding drop for all community organizing efforts. Um, and when I left the city in 2013, it had already been gutted and it just continued to get gutted after that. Um, so watching the funding that had used to been available to neighborhoods, it's like, and just people who wanted to throw a block party or something, I was like, well, this is bananas. So, and I tried to find it to do community projects in my neighborhood and I couldn't. And so I was like, well, I literally tried to ask every other organization in Burlington to house a fund that I would fundraise for because I did not want to start a nonprofit. No one in their right mind wants to start a nonprofit, not when you know what it entails. 
Um, but I started it anyway. And seven years later, I funded some really cool stuff. Like if you have been hearing about them, um, I'm the one who had the little free pantries in Burlington built um, and granted them out to people's houses, essentially. Um, had a local person build them out of sustainable materials. Um, it's been a great small project. Um, so it's stuff like that that doesn't have to be a huge project to be impactful, but really what has been, I think, you know, overall, one of the most useful things is to have an organizing structure that people can plug into and plug out to. Like I've, I've provided fiscal sponsorship for so many small grassroots groups that, you know, are not going to create their own group. Um, but if someone needs to get like a $2,000 grant, I'm like, that's no problem. Like we have a really small agreement and I just take a check for them, make sure they're using it as they said they would and give them the check back, right? Like it's, it's, it's that really low level stuff of taking care of the bureaucracy so that other people can do the good work that they need to do. Um, I do the really unsexy stuff, right? Like <laughs> I fill out tax forms. I, I organize meetings. I, you know, tell someone about legal liability and, and how, why, like what they can do that's tax fraud and what isn't tax fraud, right? Like it's really not sexy stuff, but it's really important. So like if, if other people out there, like if anyone, <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know if Noah's still on, but he could probably tell you like so many people email me and text me with like logistic questions. Like, <laughs> is it tax fraud if I don't file this financial report? I'm like, yeah, yeah actually it is, totally is. Don't do that, right? Like, <laughs> it's like the really basic questions that like, that's the stuff. If you end up being an expert in any of that stuff, share that knowledge like share it widely. Cause this is the stuff that people don't know. And it really catches them up. Like be the people that really understand the really unsexy nuts and bolts of organizational stuff and just share that information, right? Like I have been a shadow campaign manager for a couple of different people because I don't need my name on things at all. I prefer not to have my name on stuff, honestly. Um, and they wanted to learn. And I have worked with a couple people now and said, like, you be a campaign manager. I'll be here with your backup. And every couple of days we'll check in and I'll help you figure it out through it. Because then they get the knowledge of how to be a, a campaign manager and I don't have to have my name on something. So, you know, while you're doing this work, you're learning, you're building skills, share them, share them widely, share them without hesitation. You know, it, it, this is none of us do this work alone. And every time we get someone's story or we get information, just remember, like, it has to be, it has to be shared. I mean, not the story thing. I already told you my whole spiel about making sure you're not stealing people's stories. Um, but, you know, I, I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of people and, and get folks asking me for help or where they can plug in. Um, and it's a real, it's an honor, like, it's an honor to be in that position where people think of me as someone that they want to work with and that they have questions they think I can answer them. And I don't take that lightly. Um, but I do think that it's really important that when you know something, you tell other people, right? And don't ever forget that people are at the core of all of this organizing work. You know, like I got to, sorry, this is totally like not my best presentation. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's just like, but like, you got to meet people where they are. You know, I have, I got a call from my mechanic who was asking me about a trans issue because my wife is trans, like she's binary trans. And I wasn't expecting a call at eight o'clock in the morning for my mechanic, but I took it and we talked about it. Was it fun? No. Did I want to talk to him about like the intricacies of being trans in Burlington? No, no, I did not. But when someone asks you something like that and you can tell they're in good faith and they don't understand, yeah, he didn't use the right terminology. He didn't use any of the right terminology, but he was coming from an honest place and you know, now he's an incredible ally. Um, it's just about people, you know, it's, it can't be about ego. You know, it can't be about being right. It's never about being right. No one's ever right. The older I get, the more I know that I don't know anything, right? Like it's, it's one of the most humbling things in the world is getting older. Um, be good to the people you're working with, care about them, trust them. You know, if someone sucks, don't work with them anymore. Um, be really careful about like going public with stuff. I mean, I think that was important that David was saying that, like give people an opportunity to, to talk to you and do something before you publicly blast them. Like that's a nuclear option for me, right? Cause that are, that automatically says that you're not going to have a relationship with them. 
right? You're not going to work together after this. You're already in an adversarial position. And starting off in an adversarial position is it has to be a last resort, right? It's not, it's not a first step. First step is trying to get everyone on the same page and changing, like sharing information and, and building a relationship. And yeah, nuclear options are there for a reason. I've absolutely written digger op-eds and I've absolutely written public social media posts. And I did it after a lot of consideration it was not my first option. Um, and I guess, you know, as much as David could talk about how to get things moved and everyone's talking about how to pass bills, I just, I guess I want to be here to remind you that there are people behind those things. There are people in the needs of those bills. There are people making decisions, you know, and for the most part, legislators, community organizers, none of us are making any money, right? Or very little. So people are doing this because they care. And just because they might not agree with you doesn't mean they don't care. Um, so I think that's just a really important thing that tends to get lost is that, you know, passion for a subject is not going to get you everywhere you want to go. You know, you, you also have to know the people that you're working with and, and listen to them and, and treat them with some level of respect because they're another human being. And that goes both ways, but someone has to start it. I guess it's my rant. <laughs> Wow. Well, Laura, thank you so much for your honesty. I think as organizers, we are so often, we burn out. Um, I know for myself, I must be a little bit, I'm not sure why I sometimes do this to myself, go from one project to another without a break, but there's something I, I just can't stop. So we all have, a lot of us have that fire and and the honesty and I think that we're all feeling that and and whether we had wins or losses it is draining and works so hard and it's very true and and for people you know often outside you know when you're thinking about people that don't agree with you and you become very competitive and you forget that they are human and everyone makes mistakes and everyone deserves a chance to have another chance. And, um, you know, often we can get so angry at someone and not realize that they're, try they're trying to. So thank you so much. And, and I do, and we, I, we really appreciate your, your honesty and, and you are doing some incredible things and have done some incredible things in Burlington. And um, just um, before we ask how we can get involved in some of those projects and assist. I did pay attention to that part. I did actually write that part down. So I do actually have that. Oh, I'm not yeah. gonna rant on that part. <laughs> no, you can, um, cause we'd all love to help some of your amazing efforts and, and the food pantry is incredible. And um, you're such an amazing part of the old North end. Um, does anyone have any questions for Laura? Um, before we ask how we can help? Yeah. Yes, I do. Oh, Suzanne. Yes, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Um, I would actually like to chit chat with you, and if you could send me your email, I can send you mine, so we can just, get together. I'll just put it here in the have, chat. Great. My, emails, my email's really public. Like it's on so okay. many press releases and like <laughs> front porch forum posts. Um, it's totally okay. fine. Yeah. Great. I have it on direct message. I have, really I have some ideas. Okay, everyone, here we go. Great, thank you for being so accessible to everyone. Um, I mean, that's assuming I, you can email me. I can't guarantee I'm gonna get back to you really fast, but <laughs> yeah. you can totally reach that's out. Fair. <laughs> that's fair, well, great. Um, so Laura, how can, is there anything that we as community members can do to boost your efforts or going forward um, or some suggestions for people who might want to do something especially <clears throat> since the pandemic is not over. Um, I know some of our parents or maybe some people on the call have been vaccinated and might feel like they're going to hit the club, but it's not over and um, we need to still help people who are struggling. So what can you recommend that that people can do in the community or help with right now still when, when people are struggling? Sure. I mean, so it just a really totally self-serving and easy thing to do is um, if you, so if you go to the One Good Deed Fund website, it's literally One Good Deed Fund, here, I'll put it in there. I can say it as much as I want to, but I always mess it up when I actually go to type it in. Um, there is a list of where all the, the um, little free pantries are. Put food in them. 
that sounds like a really basic thing, but they get emptied really quickly. Um, like just non-perishable stuff, toiletries, things you think people might need. That is just one of those very simple things that you can do anytime, 24 seven. Um, if you're just thinking of it and you're at the grocery store, um, putting can openers in there, like, you know, easy to eat stuff that doesn't need to be cooked, um, stuff that you can grab. Um, I will say like, this is good timing. Um, I, one of the phone, one of the zoom meetings I had earlier was talking about, um, other, uh, actually a series of, um, little free boxes. I don't know what you call them. Um, an old, a caretaker with the, the community. I don't actually, I don't actually don't know what Marty's title was at parks and rec and waterfront, but, um, he built a series of small boxes, um, near places where people who were living outside tend to be. Um, and put uh, put socks in there and everything. And he left a notepad in them where people could ask for what they want. And then he'd go get it and put them in. Um, and when he left, um, they sort of hit disrepair and people haven't been doing it as much. Um, and so I'm hoping to get a team of people together who'd be interested in maintaining those, you know, and, and checking and see what people need and keeping them like well-maintained if they're falling apart, like getting folks to do that. And um, we're also talking about ways to build in um, community closets. So I think we're actually looking at putting one in a public park, which would be a place where people could put larger items and, you know, clothing and gear and things like that. And we're trying to figure out what that would look like, but it would also like, it's again, it's like the really unsexy stuff, like going to check and see if like someone's dumped trash, you know, making sure that the people like that things are in there aren't tarnished, you know, right? there's a lot of things like that, but it's just some really like you don't, it's it's good COVID safe stuff because you don't have to be in proximity to someone else to do it. And it takes a few minutes, um, but it really does take a whole bunch of people to do it effectively. Um, so if anyone is interested in that sort of thing, uh, that's the kind of like, that's the kind of stuff that I'm always getting people to do. Like <laughs> it's not marches, it's very rarely protests. But it's totally like putting food in a food pantry and like making sure that there isn't a bunch of trash by a community closet. Um, I'm also, if you are interested in doing any like more mutual aid kind of stuff with food deliveries and like picking up groceries for people and stuff like that, I'm, I'm happy to connect you to those groups. I, I know pretty much all of them. Um, I've been working a lot with Minuski Mutual Aid on a couple issues. Um, so I'm happy to plug people into those things too, if it's something you're thinking of working with. Um, but it's basically, if you are someone who likes doing things on your own schedule and filling in where you can, um, you know, I know some of us don't have a lot of capacity. I don't have a lot of capacity, um, but I can do stuff like that. So if you're looking to do anything, and even if it's just like, you can do it for a month, right? Like that's the stuff I can plug you into. Um, so totally thrilled to be able to, um, get people interested in that really, really small C community organizing stuff. Yeah, that's so great. And it has a huge impact um, on people's lives directly. And um, that's what you do. And, and that's really amazing. Um, and no, not all organizing is sexy, um, big protests and uh, so, and megaphones. Yeah, Food Not Bombs is doing some amazing, I'm. So every day when I see their their posts, I'm so inspired by a lot of the stuff that they're doing. And um, you know, I I know that in South Burlington, we don't. I feel like we. Oh, my dog's whining. I don't feel like we do enough here. So um, I reached out to um, Melissa um, to see about doing a pop up in South Burlington um, for mutual aid here. So there's there's lots of amazing organizers. Um, and Laura is connected to them all. So thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, um, Melissa's my best friend. So if you ever need connection to the other person who does all like, oh, like the free giveaway stuff with the one shop shopping, you great. tell me all that. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, that's amazing. I was like, we need that in South Burlington too. Um, and I know probably Winooski has, you guys do a lot of stuff there too. And um, yeah. you know, Josh usually took over the, the pop-ups there, which is super awesome. Oh, great. Yeah, I know Josh. Yeah from Winooski and um, we might have some other folks from Winooski as well. So um, that's so great. Thank you so much, Laura, um, yeah. for, for all your work. And um, it's a pleasure to know you. Um, oh, and same. And it, like, thank you all who are on this because you clearly are on this Zoom call on a Wednesday night. It's Wednesday, right? Um, because you care. 
Um, so I, I think that that really matters, right? Like even, even if you do nothing else in the next month, except pay attention and care, that's a lot, you know, it doesn't always have to be constant activity. I think it just matters a lot that you stay in it. It's true. I agree. Get vaccinated, get vaccinated when you can get vaccinated. Sign yes. up even if you're, you don't feel like you can, as soon as you can sign up for a vaccine, just say yes. that. Yes, no, that is, we're all looking forward to being vaccinated and, and um, being able to have these in person again and have a community dinner going along with these meetings and, and really feel the community connection. I know that we're all really lacking and um, soon the weather will be nice. So walks are always an option too. Um, so if socially distant walking uh, with friends is always helpful. So thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, and, I'm gonna uh, pop off, but I'm thanks for having excited. me. Have a great rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you. Well, that was just great. Laura has been such a champion um, in the Old North End for so long and has also quietly behind the scenes helped a lot of people get elected who um, are, munis are serving um, municipally and um, um, definitely have admire admired Laura's work. So moving on, um, now we will hear from Tom, oh yes, and if people have to pop off, totally understandable. Uh, oh, I thought that was, oh no, just, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna hear from Tom, who was the lead organizer for um, Just Cause Eviction, and um, also was an incredible lead organizer. Thank you for your leadership, Tom. And I know um, I personally didn't know Tom on a one-on-one -on -one basis before that, but admire his tenacity and passion for, <clears throat> excuse me, just cause and everything that, that he did, you could tell he was doing it as we talked about earlier for the right reasons and not for any of his self, of selfish gain. It was very evident that he really cares about our community and put that into work and worked, seemed like 24 hours a day. I don't know when he slept, but um, we're all so grateful for all the work and Christy and, and Emily and others on this call who, who work so hard on Just Cause. And I know we already had a question um, about it. And uh, great to see you, Kel. Thanks for coming. Um, we, we would love to hear from Tom and some next steps and, and how um, we can move this to a statewide um, agenda and um, where we go from here. So Tom, take it away. Thank you, Emily, for the introduction. Um, and I just want to start out by just thanking uh, everyone on the call that helped out with this. Um, so Christy and Emily Lifstowich, of course, but Emily, you also did a ton of work. David Zuckerman um, also gave us a huge shout out um, and was part of, of some of the videos that we'd be, we were making towards the end. Um, Sophie helped out a bunch as well. Yep. Um, Zariah Hightower would be remiss to, to not mention her. She was pretty instrumental in getting this passed, in fact, getting this to the table in the first place. So this was a real community effort. Um, and, uh, and I was obviously absolutely thrilled when we managed to pass it by 63%, um, on town hall meeting day. Um, the fight is definitely not over um as david kind of spoke to earlier on um it's going to really make a difference in terms of uh, who co-sponsors this once it gets to the state house um and if the entirety of the burlington delegation do sign on now we've got some big advocates in that burlington delegation already um some of the names probably won't won't surprise many people. Um, Selena Colburn, Brian Gina, Emma Mulvaney Stanick, um, all huge advocates for um, for just cause eviction, and will will be there in the state house touting its its uh, how it will benefit the city of Burlington. Um, they're currently huddling with the rest of the Burlington delegation to try and get everyone on board uh, and doing what they can to try and bring everyone over. Um, they're hopeful that's going to be able to happen, um, but 
it was a pretty contentious, uh, pretty contentious charter change. And uh, I feel that especially in the new North End and the South End, um, there are folks that, or at least constituents that have had reservations that um, the, the representatives are going to have to answer to. So we need to make sure that we've got uh, all our ducks in a row and everyone's on board before we go forward with this. Um, but the plan is at the moment is to get the entirety of the Burlington delegation to carry sponsor. Um, and then we're going to be uh, talking about strategy and whether or not we try and pass this as a kind of a charter change omnibus bill, which as I understand it is how a lot of charter changes often go through the state house. Um, I'm not very well versed in that. This is my first charter change that I've tried to push through, so I may be wrong. David Zuckerman, maybe you can you can correct me after this if I if I am wrong on that. Um, I have heard though that that because there was four different charter changes and because each one there's a couple of pretty contentious ones in there, uh, this might all get split up. Um, so I'm waiting on the Burnley delegation. Um, to get back to us on what their next meeting uh, ends up uh, with the conclusion they come to in their next meeting. Um, and then once it starts getting in the state house, I'm going to be really deferring to what they feel is going to be best. But I think as David kind of pointed out earlier on, um, the way that activists work in this is kind of going to be different to the Burlington City Council, where we kind of turn up and we hit those city council meetings and, and we, we try and get as many people to call in as possible. Um, I think that's important, but the way that we conduct ourselves is going to have to change a little bit. And um, we've got to really make sure we don't alienate ourselves uh, in the state house uh, or to state reps in order to try and um, get this through. Uh, really, this in this kind of situation, uh, it's you catch more flies of honey than you do vinegar is what is the, the message I've heard loud and clear from a few fantastic people are helping us work on this. Um, so I will hopefully be updating this chapter um, each month on Just Cause, or at least um, uh, a few times, at least uh, over the years, over the year. Um, so if we do have things that we need help with, we can, we can call on you folks and maybe you can call a state rep or, or email or, even better than that, um, speak to us and, and share your stories about evictions because those stories have been really instrumental in getting it this far. And we've been told that, that those stories will also be very instrumental in getting it through the state house as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I got for you. Well, great. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, I know a lot of people had to pop off. Um, just so everyone knows, I am going to try to keep these meetings to an hour, but this one we had so many incredible speakers. So we wanted to make extra space, but um, that's great. And um, does anyone have any questions for Tom or um, David as well involving a legislative process or charter change or um, what they can do or not do or any questions about Just Cause um, right at this moment? And obviously Tom is very accessible. Um, you all know how to find him, I believe, so. Um, does anyone have any questions about, oh, Christy, okay. And Christy was recently on VPR again, um, talking about Just Cause. So yes, Christy, go ahead. Yes, that, that conversation on VPR was them asking exactly what was going on in the landlord's minds and what was going on in the tenant's minds during, for housing during the pandemic and what tenants were feeling. I thought it was great. I love being on the show. I hope that I did a good job. I'm not really used to all this stuff, but I'm, I'm having a blast with it. The only thing that I would really have an ask for is those tenants' stories. We just can't get these tenants to say anything because they are so dang scared because of retaliation from their landlords. Yeah. We just can't get them to open up. So if you get anyone, and I do mean any one of the tenants that has a story, ask them to send it to either the Just Cause Evictions website through that email, or to have it sent to the Burlington Tenants Union at gmail.com. 
and we'll collect these stories and we don't need people's names. We don't care about their addresses. We would like to know who their landlords are so that we can, you know, get a good consensus going with some of that information, but we need all the stories we can get our hands on because that's ultimately what's going to end up helping us push this through at the final or those stories. Yeah, it's so, it's so true. We, we definitely need more tenants stories um, in this narrative um, for sure. Thank you, Christy, for all your work. Um, does anyone else have a question for Tom? Okay. Well, thank you for many of the folks um, on this call. Um, and yes, for Councillor Hightower and um, David for their videos and um, boosting, signal boosting to their networks and uh, really helping us um, get our message across. And it was very exciting. Um, you know, not, not um, all wins on town meeting day, but definitely some things to be proud of. And as David and others who have been Meg and others who have been organizing in the state house for a long time know that it's often a long game. And uh, sometimes you don't see things uh, come to fruition for a long time and definitely know that with cannabis and, and some other things that are finally happening. So it can take time, but um, yes, thank you, Gary. Um, okay, so finally, before we wrap up, um, let's hear from Sophie, who's going to, um, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Gary. Who is going to talk about uh, quickly some rad stuff that people can tap into that's coming up. So um, Sophie is, I believe, you're, are you the development coordinator? Yeah, so my role is leadership development coordinator. I'm really happy to be with all of you. It's been a full, a full Zoom room tonight and really glad for that. Um, so there's a lot going on at RAD, um, and so I'm just going to pop into the chat again. This is the agenda for tonight, so you can check out the notes in the future. Um, but also way at the bottom of that doc is a list of upcoming events, and I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, yeah, thanks for being here, David. Take care. Um, so. Thursday weekly phone bank. This is a great opportunity to practice calling folks in Vermont. Um, every Thursday, we're calling supporters across the state to build momentum for our 2021 campaigns, um, really to advance housing, climate, food, education, justice in our state. And you can register for um, register for a shift right here in this link um, in the agenda. And so that's our first one. So it's happening tomorrow, if you're available tomorrow evening. And then I think, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're on for the next week facilitating the... So in a couple of weeks, you could sign up for a shift and phone bank with Tom Proctor. <laughs> okay, so next we have, and Gary already shared this, but the Vermont Renews Convergence. So thank you so much, Gary. Um, this is happening this Sunday, March 28th. And um, you can learn more about it by clicking that link. Um, we have the movement reading group that is also starting on Sunday and um, Zariah Hightower is one of our awesome facilitators leading that out. Um, we're reading The Purpose of Power by Alicia Garza and um, it's gonna be a monthly, a monthly meeting for folks to gather and to really share about reactions, um, thoughts, um, and really build community over the over um, these readings is really important reading so feel free to click on that link and sign up um, for that right there and then a couple okay so save the date April 29th at 7pm we're going to be doing a power building training this is really focusing on the fundamentals of one to one so conversations that really build power that strengthen our networks and strengthen our relationships with each other. Um, so this is going to be really exciting. There isn't a link created yet, but just if you're interested in learning more about that, um, put a little um, note on your calendar. And yeah, this last thing, here we go. Sorry, I'm, I'm zooming so quickly through this. Um, but we have a community Slack. I don't know if folks are familiar with Slack, but it's a digital platform. 
um, that can be a great place to connect with other people. You can post about events that you care about. You can um, ask questions. Um, certainly if Emily, if you had like a question for your agenda, you know, that's something that you could pose in there. Um, we, we post articles and things like that. So this is, it's a bi-state um, Slack channel. So folks in New Hampshire and Vermont have access to that. Um, okay. Whew. I think I, I think I did it all there. Um, I'm, through it. <laughs> I'm gonna just, um, you know, if you have any questions about these, uh, about these events, you can email me, um, and I will put that in the agenda as well. Great. Um, thank you so much, Sophie, and for all you do. Um, so um, before we wrap up, I have two questions for you all. Next month, and I promise we're going to keep them to an hour. Um, a lot of people, even my dog's getting very restless. He'd like his dinner. Um, who would, so we need to assign roles for, for next um, month's meeting. We need a timekeeper. Christy, you want to do it again? Okay, Christy's going to time keep. And then would anyone like to be the note taker um, for next month's meeting? I believe, so they're the third Wednesday, the last, oh, last, last Wednesday. Now I'm like blanking. Sophie, what's, do you have the date on the April meeting? Oof. Yeah, one moment. So I have, let's see here, we have... <laughs> Here is the next meeting is April 28th, Wednesday okay. the 28th. And here in the chat, you can actually sign right up. Oh, yep. And we'll try for Taylor again. Um, obviously, she's so swamped. I don't even know if they're still on the floor. I haven't checked. I'm going to check after this because I'm a po political nerd and like to know what's going on in the House floor. Um, but hopefully she'll be able to join us next time. Um, but yeah, OK, so yes, no. Oh, they are? Oh, gross. I feel bad for them. Um, okay, and then uh, note taker. Um, Heather took notes. No, I'm sure you did an incredible job. Um, no worries. Thank you so much for committing to do that. That's so nice of you. Um, note taking is uh, not always the most fun. Some people love it. Um, and then, um, but yeah, does anyone uh, want to take notes next time? And if not, they can always find me or Sophie or someone and step up. And if not, um, that's okay too. We'll figure it out. Any takers for next month? Raising hands, no? Okay, yeah, I can't offer any prizes or anything, but okay, great. Well, we'll figure it out for next month. And next month, like I said, I'll try, Taylor will try it again. She, she feels terrible, but obviously they're trapped. Uh, on Zoom land on the floor. And then um, I also have a friend who does a lot of um, really amazing criminal justice work in the community. Oh, okay, great. Well, Emily, thank you so much. Um, you're awesome. But yeah, so we're gonna have an awesome April meeting. And um, to those of you like myself who celebrate Passover, um, have a good uh, Passover. Oh, great. Thank you, Josh. And it's great to see you. Thanks for coming from Winooski, um, like myself, a Burlington outsider. Um, but yeah, happy Passover to those who celebrate um, this weekend. And I'll see everyone next month. Thank you so much. Bye.